Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, my, my name is Daniel. I'm a director at SNAP, working on our ER Glasses program. And I have the pleasure to talk a little bit about you, where we are with glasses, where we came from, and what I believe we are go going to see next. Um, okay, so quick overview. I will talk today about several key moments in the past 25 years in the ER hardware and software development. And there's a plenty of projects, efforts, companies, products, um, probably hundreds of those, which I will not be able to cover. So I listed a few of those here. I will not be able to cover all of these. So what I decided is I will follow those on the path that I mostly joined. Um, and that goes a little bit in the, in the vibe that Ori presented this morning. There was actually a lot of contributions to ER here in Austria. So let's start. And our journey starts in about 1996. At that time, ER systems were mostly stationary room systems, meaning you had setups where, what do you think, technical problems? Okay. Okay. Meaning we had technical setups um, which were consisted of expensive graphics computers and roof-mounted trackers, as you can see on the picture here, um, they had a magnetic tracker mounted on the ceiling which was creating a 3D magnetic field and then tethered sensors which would sense that. Um, glasses were very rudimentary at that point compared to today and all that was tethered and a lot of the focus at that time was actually on bringing together all these complex components to one system and this is how this looked like. So at that time content was still a difficult problem. We have very few content creators 25 years ago. So the researchers mostly focused then on, on stuff they could create easily, like mathematical shapes and how to interact with them. And then a few years later, we saw that ER could move from the stationary systems to mobile system, thanks to notebooks becoming powerful enough to actually do what graphics computers had, were doing before. Um, but still, these were very complex systems. They had to combine a notebook with glasses, cameras, GPS, compass, IMU markers, touchpads, and many of these components even needed their own power, power supplies. So these are very complex setups. Um, and again, a lot of work actually went into putting them together. So this is another setup developed here in Vienna. Um, it was called the Air Tourist Guide. And what Gerhard, the researcher there did was he took one of the the city maps of the city of Vienna, extruded it to 3D geometry, add, hand added his own annotations in there, and took some data probably from Wikipedia to allow to browse the city there in a very small environment. And then a few years later, this is when I joined, um, we saw the first systems um, being able to do similar things on mobile phones and personal digital assistants. They became powerful enough to also run similar types of experiences. And what was very convenient is for the first time we had all the necessary components in one device. We had the compute power, we had the display, the touchpad, the camera, but there was absolutely no AR software running on those devices. It wasn't even any 3D software. So there was a lot of, of work that had to be done from scratch. Um, and one of the first things that we did was this application that allowed you to be navigated around inside the building um, conveniently, we had these black and white markers at the Institute, hundreds of them, very accurately measured where they are in space. So if you pointed your camera at one of these black and white markers, it would know where you are and then be able to guide you through the building. So obviously, by today's standards, that was a very simple rudimentary software, almost actually almost no immersion at all, um, and running just at five hertz, but you have to start somewhere. And then a few years later, phones became more, more powerful, software became better. So this is a, a demo that we did for the SIGGRAPH conference, where this was a two-player game. You had these virtual trains running on the, on the track, it was called the invisible train, um, and you couldn't stop them. The only thing you could do is you could switch the, the train tracks in order to prevent them from colliding.
And then as software got better and devices got more powerful, we could make the move to um, what is called natural feature tracking, so no more of these black and white markers. Instead, we were able to de detect and track these posters and then have actually beautiful animations running on these for marketing campaigns and other things. And then, as Ori mentioned in the talk to this morning, there was a small breakthrough on the hardware side. Mobile phones were equipped with GPS and compass, uh, magnetometers, mostly for the purpose of running things like Google Maps. But there was a small company here in Austria called Wikitude that recognized that very early on, um, and that sparked the creation of the so-called air browsers. Um, after a year or two, there was at least a dozen of these air browsers around. Um, but Wikitude was, as far as I know, really the first one here from Austria, um, and it used existing data sources such as Flickr, Wikipedia, or Google. And over time, they extended their offerings to have full, a full ER SDK for multi-platform. And then about two years ago, they were acquired by a, another big player in ER called Qualcomm. So Qualcomm is probably the biggest um, chip maker for, ER for, for mobile phones. If you have a mobile phone that you either have a Qualcomm chip in there or something that is patented by Qualcomm, I mean, about 2007, Qualcomm knew that the smartphone would become a dominant compute platform. They were already in that market, but they saw where this could lead to. But they also realized that um, this platform would always have its UX limitations. And they identified that ER um, would enable new types of experiences and new devices. And they also understood that with VR, there would be a strong impact on their chipset architecture. So by 2010, Qualcomm already had two parallel AR efforts running. One, which is very well known, Euphoria, which became the probably first professionally supported AR solution for mobile phones. And another one, which was an internal R&D effort, which looked much further out to look into new future technologies, which would eventually mature such that it become could become part of their chipset line, either on the software or the hardware side. Um, and Qualcomm has ever since continued this internal ARD effort. Um, and today, Qualcomm is one of the very few chip makers who have differentiating um, XR technology. So in basically every chip from Qualcomm today, there are certain hardware units in there just for XR. Um, and because of that, I Qualcomm is also one of the biggest chipset players in the airspace today. You have companies like Meta or, or, or Microsoft who use Qualcomm chips in their devices. So what about Euphoria? Eventually, Qualcomm noticed that Euphoria wasn't really a fit for their strategy. I mean, in 2015, PTC acquired Euphoria from Qualcomm. Um, and the, co the core of Euphoria engine team is still here located in Vienna, and some of them are actually here in the building. And today, Euphoria is an integral part of PTC's product line. So what is the product line? They have two main types of offerings. There's a solution-oriented offering, which is about out-of-the-box solutions, like one is called Chalk, which is about the, the well-known um, remote expert use case. So a user somewhere on site has a problem, calls for support, and that remote support person can now interact in 3D in the environment with the person on site. Um, and another one is called Expert Capture, which is about creating instructions and guidance systems. And then they have the developer-oriented offerings like the Vuforia Studio, Vuforia Engine, and Spatial Toolbox. So this is how this looks like. Here you can see a user using the um, PTC desk, uh, computer suite to set up their ER system in the factory, and then they can go there in situ, interact with the, with the machine, see some live data, and then reconfigure the machine to whatever they have to do to overcome that problem. And then there was another um, player in the industrial headset space uh, called Duckry. So Duckry was originally one of the largest and most successful third-party developers using Euphoria. And in 2014, Duckry decided that they want to pivot um, and become a hardware vendor on their own and they started working on this ear helmet. So this helmet used a PC-grade um, compute hardware and then combined with an optical see-through display. Tons of sensors that were useful for industry, like color cameras, computer vision cameras, depth cameras, thermal cameras, all in one hardened shell that was suitable for rough environments. 
So in the early days, uh, Dacry had also the construction field in mind. Um, over time, they noticed that enterprise and industry is more interesting. So eventually the helmet was superseded by a device in a glasses form factor, which was more or less exactly the same hardware internally. So the compute pack, which was first on the back and then and, and the battery on the top, both of those moved on the, with the glasses to a belt unit. The only thing that was really removed was the thermal sensor. Um, but Dacry was not a, a hardware vendor. They provided solutions for enterprise and industry. So the hardware came with a suite of, of applications. I will show you two, two here. The first one is called Show. This is again a, the very common remote expert use case where you have somebody on site, like in this case here in the server cabinet, who needs help. So that person calls for remote support and that remote support person can now make annotations, say, press this button, turn off this device here in order to continue. And another one is called Tag, which is about um, interacting with machines. So this one here, you set up your links to your machine data up front, and then you can see this in situ with a machine that wouldn't have its own type of displays. Okay, and in 2019, Dacry was working full steam on its next generation hardware. This was a, a complete redo. We were working on a device which had much more compute power, um, super low latency by having hardware a hardware-assisted low-latency component um, would have it brought back the thermal sensor, some in-house developed display hardware, and even more ruggedized. But there are challenges with industrial AR for companies like these. Um, industry has very special needs, and they are very willing to pay for those if, you, if they can make the math that this will solve problems. So that is great, but it also usually needs very special solutions. Um, and those are difficult to address with general purpose software suites. So what that means in practice is that after a substantial validation process, um, it can then take years and years until that is actually rolled out in a production line. And that compared to the high tech industry means that the industry is actually moving very slow. And eventually, that actually ran into troubles, um, exited to Snap, and its software team joined Snap. So. This is how I came to Snap. Um, and Snap is working, as probably most people here know, besides the Snapchat app, also on an air glasses line called Spectacles. So that program started about eight years ago. And in 2016, we released our first um, glasses, which were mainly pure picture taking and video taking glasses, like the Ray-Ban stories. Um, so with a single click of a button, you could take a picture or video that was streamed to your phone and then could, could use it in Snapchat to share it with your friends. So these are how the first generation looked like. And then two years later, there was a second generation which improved upon that with more robust hardware, better image quality, better integration into Snapchat. And then a year later was the version three, which upgraded to stereo cameras. And with that, the, the glasses could have a much better world understanding and create 3D pictures and so on. And then in 2021, Snap released its very first true air glasses. These glasses had the ability to display lenses, which is something you normally have in Snapchat on your phone. Display the same lenses in 3D on the glasses, in standalone and in full 3D. So this was, to my knowledge, the first of its kind in that form factor with those capabilities. So there's no tethering or, or compute pack. There are cameras, uh, microphones, stereo speakers to make it a full air multimedia device. Um, it's capable to run indoors and outdoors. And it has all the things you would expect from an AR device today. Full sticks of tracking, face tracking, body tracking, marker tracking, scene understanding, and all that with just 134 grams, meaning it's actually comfortable to wear for quite a long time. An application development is done with Lens Studio, which is Snap's software suite for creators, which means it is very easy to create lenses for this device. And one thing that is always important to Snap is that these things are, look like natural devices, not so much like, like, like tech gadgets. And while it's certainly clear you can still recognize it as tech gadget, it is much more socially acceptable, we believe, than most other air glasses. Okay, let me quickly recap how we got here. So the first air systems were big stationary room systems, used expensive computers, with specialized graphics programming unit and a lot of system effort. 
Um, then we saw the first mobile systems that used notebooks. Those were, still had to be extended with complex other components like displays, IMUs, and so on. Then we saw mobile phones, which provided what notebooks could do before, but in a much smaller form factor, lower cost, wider availability, but also less compute power. And today, we have a, a wide range of ER, XR, MR glasses. Um, so this is a, one way to categorize them. This is the one that I chose. There are certainly many other ways to do that. So one category that I see is optical see-through glasses or, or headsets aiming for maximum capability, like the HoloLens or the Magic Leap. These are usually relatively large and expensive, but they have a lot of compute power and pretty wide field of view. Then another category are, which is like, like the breakthrough we saw this year, um, VR goggles with good pass-through, like the Quest 3, the Lynx, or the Apple Vision Pro next year. These have the widest field of view that is technically possible today. Um, they are great at compositing real and virtual, but they mainly aim at indoor usage. These devices are not great for outdoors. Um, then there are highly specialized industrial enterprise devices, like from Musix, Realware, Iristic. Those have often very special features. For example, the devices that have a, a laser pointer and a, and a telecamera, so you can scan barcodes at a distance. They are not aiming at immersion, usually. And then there's a large number of low-cost, tethered devices, usually with relatively simple optics, like the X-Real Air. These oft, most often just have freedom of tracking, and they mainly aim at head-fixed video watching. So having your mobile virtual TV with you all the time. And then there is the category that, that we are in, um, small, lightweight, and optical see-through. Obviously, those are, with today's technology, a compromise between form factor, display, and compute power. But let's see, where are we heading? Um, I strongly believe that in the long run, all glasses makers want the following. So obviously, if you have to choose between tethered and untethered, you do want untethered. I mean, that seems clear, but, but probably also cloud-connected for AI and other use cases. Um, then lightweight. Less than 100 gram is necessary to make these devices wearable for a long time. We strongly believe that optical see-through is the way to go for an optimal display comfort. Wide field of view, obviously, for maximum immersion. And then, of course, you want lots of compute power for compelling applications. Unfortunately, that is not altogether possible with the technology we have today. So everybody has to make their compromises. Um, so if we look at it, for example, HoloLens compromises on the weight. I think it weighs about half a kilogram. Magic Leap is tethered um, and also not that lightweight. The Quest Pro is not that lightweight and uses video pass-through. The Apple Vision Pro is on top of that also tethered, but has a lot of compute power. And then you see that the spectacles are at the other end of the spectrum. So we, they compromise on the field of view and the compute power that is possible today. Okay, wrapping up, where is Snap's vision for air glasses? So, we believe this can be, become a very, very large market, probably as large as the mobile phone market is today, but it will take at least until the end of the decade to see a broad adoption. Then we believe air glasses need to be socially acceptable, meaning they need to feel comfortable and natural to wear and use. Obviously, you want untethered, but they also need to be lightweight, you don't want skiing goggles in, in, uh, on your face when you walk around, and they need to be comfortable. And then you need to be able to use them indoors and outdoors, meaning you need displays that allow you to stay engaged wherever you are. Um, and as already mentioned, our belief is that for those, optical see-through are most suitable. Okay, thank you. <laughs>